I would say, you know, uh, Laura, uh, welcome. Hi there. Can you hear me? Uh, we can't friends hear you. and hope. Yeah, I can hear you. Yes. Okay. And all my friends around the world, uh, good afternoon. Okay. Um, Great to have you. Uh, I just, uh, you know, explained and introduced uh, who you are. You're, in my opinion, the grand lady of supply chain. Uh, uh, last month, you were awarded as uh, the number one supply chain influencer in the world, the female one. I want, uh, but in, in my sense, uh, you are male or female, the, the, the number one global influencer in supply chain. So um, I give the floor to you, and uh, we we'll get back later on. So uh, I hand it over to you. And so I'm uh, very curious about your presentation. Laura, to you. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for the remarks and the introduction. Uh, it's humbling to uh, be introduced like that, but I have been in supply chain for almost 40 years, and I try to help supply chain leaders to understand the journey of excellence, how they align to drive excellence, and the choices they make to make a difference. So. What I'm going to present today is a study that we've done over the past seven years. It's a study of supply chain excellence, and it came out of my curiosity of what is an excellent supply chain and how long does it take to actually reach excellence and how do we sustain excellence? So we looked at 440 publicly traded companies. So if they're publicly traded on any of the stock exchanges around the world, they're in this index in 28 industry sectors. And it's just crazy to compare Boeing to Apple or Apple to BASF because the industries are so different. So we wanted to divide companies into industry sectors and then look at how companies progressed in growth, inventory turns, operating margin and return on invested capital and how those intersections change because the supply chain is a complex nonlinear system. And, you know, the methodology is that we take the public reporting and we look at the peer group analysis and we ask first, is this company driving improvement at the intersection against the peer group? It's amazing how many companies are not driving improvement. In fact, 85% of companies are not driving improvement. And one of the issues is that they'll focus on singular metrics. So Daniel Myers at Mondelez focused on cash to cash, elongated payables, and threw the supply chain out of balance. Similarly, Kraft Heinz right now is very focused on cost and throwing the supply chain out of balance. And so, Companies that drive improvement holistically at the intersection of operating margin and inventory turns and growth and return on invested capital look at the long view and the intersection of how they drive value. Uh, Laura, and, uh, to, to interrupt, could you uh, put on your screen, you have supporting slides. So let me check if you share your slides to it. So I think I'm sharing, am I not? No, no, sorry. Uh, no, uh, we are checking, so. You know, you have, you know you're getting there, you know. Yeah. Yes, now we see it, right, okay. Okay, yes. all right. Go. Okay. So these slides will be shared uh, by Martin and the group, and it's my honor to be here today. Uh, and what we're going to be talking about is how companies drive improvement, what is value, and what is performance. And we're going to look closely at growth, operating margin, inventory turns, and return on invested capital. And you might say, well, Laura, why did you choose these metrics? Well, many times I go into supply chain organizations and they have a bevy of metrics. In fact, I went into a Honeywell SNOP metric discussion and they had 52 metrics that they were bannering about. And I said, how do you know what the most important is and how do you track improvement? They're like, well, we don't, we just look at functional metrics. So 
I find companies that look at seven to nine metrics, and I would add customer service to this, but there is no global standard for customer service that I can use in this analysis. So I started this journey with Arizona State University and a great team of statisticians, and I said, of 180 metrics that are available from public reporting, what combination of metrics has the highest correlation to market capitalization? I was using market capitalization as a proxy for value. So we went through a lot of regression analysis and we chose the baseline of growth, operating margin, inventory turns, every turn on invested capital. Now you may wanna use gross margin or you may wanna use EBITDA. I'm not going to split hairs, not a lot of difference there in terms of the correlation. But the key is that you don't wanna use working capital because, or cash to cash, because it's a compound metric. And most of the time people will hide the fact that we're not making progress on inventory by basically looking at cash to cash and elongation of payables and feel good about what they're doing when they shouldn't. The second thing is many times people will say, well, the supply chain is a simple triangle. I trade off margin, inventory turns, and customer service. And that is also not a true statement because what we're doing in asset choices is just as important there. Often I'll find that people are very heavily asset utilized and with variability increasing, it requires more assets. So how we measure and how we manage a balanced portfolio is important. I want to stress we've got to get out of functional metrics like OEE or purchase price variance and focus on total cost. And only 29% of companies can easily get to total cost. Technology is available, it's just orientation and a balanced portfolio. So let's get on with it. So why the supply chains to admire? I'm a research gal, you may have seen me on LinkedIn. I use my work on LinkedIn as a research panel and I wanted an objective measurement of supply chain excellence for our research. I wanted to be able to come and talk to leaders and understand where they were against their peer group. The second thing is I wanted to share data to help supply chain leaders objectively benchmark and build balanced portfolios. I find often that people will pick targets that aren't realistic, that are not in alignment with their particular industry and throw the supply chain out of balance. And I also wanted to understand the choices that companies have made, which choices drove the best balance sheet performance and how long does it take for supply chain paths or processes or technology implementations to translate to balance sheet performance, which by the way, it's three to four years. And the only correlation that we can find around choice to value are improvements in sales and operations planning, supplier reliability, and visibility of what's happening on inbound transportation and with suppliers. And I often will hear people talk about end-to-end -end strategies, so order to cash or procure to pay and ERP, and I cannot find a correlation to ERP to a specific consulting partner to a specific technology, but I do find correlation to the investment in horizontal processes like sales and operations planning, supplier development, and uh, being able to work cross-functionally. The other thing we wanted to do, number four, was to help supply chain leaders talk the language of finance and to help them build in digital twins simulation to help them understand that the supply chain is a complex nonlinear system and that inventory is both the most important buffer and a big source of waste in the supply chain and to understand what's needed for form and function of inventory and how growth strategies translate to cost and inventory and the asset strategy. We have elongated the tail of the supply chain in many companies, increasing complexity, and it has carried cost and inventory and most people have not been able to model it to help the finance team understand the trade-off. 
and we wanted something that was data driven. So we wanted to build a model that would reward companies for resilience, the ability to drive consistent results year over year and to weather market factors, which COVID-19 is certainly an unprecedented market factor. We wanted to reward companies that had balance, so an organizational alignment on balance scorecard that were outperforming their peer group, driving improvement and delivering value. And we measure value as either market capitalization to the peer group or price to book. Either will work in this analysis and we track both. Now, the interesting thing was when I started this, you know, I got really excited about improvement and how fast companies could drive improvement. And what I find is companies that are not as good in supply chain will drive improvement really quickly. Companies that have been at it for a long time will find it really difficult to drive performance. And an analogy I use is sports. So if you're a class bicyclist, you know, you may need to get new pedals or new helmets or, you know, change your training routine. Supply chains are a lot like this. So, you know, if I use household products, Church and Dwight had a lot to improve, whereas Procter & Gamble started on the journey of supply chain, source, make, and deliver together in 1982. <clears throat> so improvement for Procter & Gamble is much harder than it is for Church and Dwight. And so as we look at this, there's a balance between performance and improvement. And the balance scorecard that we're measuring and rewarding companies is the ability to balance growth, profitability, inventory turns, and return on invested capital. To be able to drive performance and improvement on these metrics year over year, and we do orbit charts of all 440 companies. And let me tell you a little bit about orbit charts. So I was looking for a way that I could look at patterns in pattern recognition of supply chain leaders. And I actually had a summer intern who came up with this methodology who said, Laura, what if you track each point year over year at the intersection of these metrics and you look at the pattern and the patterns tell the story, and indeed they do. So this is Snyder Electric. I'm a big fan of Snyder Electric. I think Annette Clayton, when she did her end-to-end -end strategy, is one of the best case studies in supply chain, and I think Murad has continued that trajectory. But let's look at Snyder Electric. In 2010, you can see where they were, and they actually went backwards in margin 2010, 2011 came a little bit forward in 2012, 2013, 2014. They were on an inventory journey by and large as they went through the end-to-end -end supply chain strategy. And then they started pushing margin. And since 2017 to 2019, Murad has made a better attempt at balance to drive improvement in both inventory and margin simultaneously. Now, if you look at the company, the average results were 14% margin and 5.03 inventory turns. So every company will put the averages in the box. But what's important is to look at the company versus the industry peer group. And if you want to see your peer group, we do this analysis and we post it every year. So 2010 to 2017 for the industry, which was the diversified industries, are shown on orange. And the diversified industries were 14% margin, 5.0 inventory turns, 08. And Schneider Electric was 14% margin, so right at the industry average, and 5.03 inventory turns. So Schneider Electric falls out of the supply chain to admire because they're underperforming the peer group in inventory turns. And they're also underperforming in a couple other metrics. But for this analysis, let's just stay here. Now, you can see Snyder Electric has a bigger pattern within the industry, which means that for this period, they were less resilient at these two metrics. So this is an orbit chart. It is a study of patterns. And so when we do the orbit charts, we look at the intersection of inventory turns and operating margin 
and we call that strength in the supply chain index, which is a three factor improvement analysis. So the first thing we measure is strength at the intersection of the orbit chart. Then we look at resiliency. How big is the pattern? How small is the pattern? Are they consistent? And then we look at balance at the intersection of growth and return on invested capital. And this balance issue is a struggle for companies that are trying to grow. And we find that companies that are really mature will fall out of the supply chains to admire on the balance metric. So Procter & Gamble falls out on the balance metric, unable to grow at the industry peer group. Now, the other things that we look at is what's happening in the industry. So these are days of inventory by industry, and it's a comparison across time period. And what I want you to see is 2017 was a horrible recession, right? And 2019 is the only pandemic that we've lived through, by and large. And look at the inventory levels versus 2007, right? and the difference across industries. We just haven't been doing a good job on inventory management. Inventory is both muda or waste, and it's also our most important buffer. And unfortunately, most people only look at measurement of safety stock, not really the design of the supply chain for form and function of inventory. So one of the most important things I think we need to do for corporate sustainability is get inventory right, right? We're making a lot of stuff we don't need and we throw it away, a lot of waste. And we hide our analysis on inventory by looking at working capital or cash to cash. And we've elongated payables, pushing costs and waste back in the supply chain and not really held, hold ourselves accountable for inventory. And why is this, right? Well, it's because we've been very functional, very traditional, and we haven't tackled the hard problems. And in fact, I've been an industry analyst now for two decades, and the analysis keeps coming up with similar gaps. Companies are struggling for visibility. We've got a lot of black holes in the supply chain. And sometimes people will say, ah, I need a control tower. And I say, well, what are you gonna control? And let's get really clear about what you mean for visibility. And I've done a lot of writing on this. There's probably 200 different black holes in the supply chain. One of the things that I ask people to do is get clear on visibility by looking at where were your black holes of the last year and how can you close them? So for example, inbound transportation is a barrier for many people for customer service on time on the outbound. Because if we can't manage the inbound, we can't manage the outbound. The second is cross-functional alignment. If our commercial teams are not aligned with our operational teams, then it's very hard for us to drive that valid scorecard. And so what I encourage people to do is to focus the functions on reliability demand planning on forecast value add, manufacturing on first pass yield and reliability against the schedule attainment, purchasing against first pass quality of the suppliers and on time delivery to the factories, reliability metrics, and move past the functional metrics of OEE, purchase price variance, or sales forecasting. Sales forecasting tends to have the highest bias and error of any function that we have in this supply chain. And then demand and supply volatility, I encourage people to look outside in, to be able to look at what is baseline and how do I bring consumption signals in and translate it with very little latency? And how do I manage supply volatility? You know, it's so interesting to me that only a third of companies know where their second and third tier suppliers are and only 20% of companies have a supplier development program. So manage supply volatility and ability to use data. We're very data rich and insights poor. But the fifth thing, and one of the reasons why I do this research is the executive team understanding the supply chain. Most people in finance will look at the supply chain in an Excel spreadsheet and they'll say, well, you know, we can improve costs. And they're not really looking at the impact of the asset strategy or the inventory strategy. And they're not seeing the interrelationship 
of this complex nonlinear supply chain where the relationships are interwoven and very tight and we can't measure them in a spreadsheet, which is why I wanted to do this research. And my goal is to improve the executive team understanding the supply chain to help us close the gap of too many measurements, focus on functional performance, setting singular cost goals with a short-term focus, throwing the supply chain out of balance, lack of awareness in the industry, and confusion of finance. Okay, with all that, let's announce the winners, right? So if we look at the Supply Chains to Admire award winners, there are 22 award winners. The three retail award winners have really challenged themselves to redefine retail business models. The Dollar Tree and also Dollar General historically has won the award winner, have redefined retail in the US for the dollar conscious shopper. TGX has also redefined apparel retail for the dollar conscious shopper. Ahold has just done supply chain well. If you look at Ahold versus Tesco or Sainsbury, you know, the results are just really much, much better. Okay, now let's look at process. The longest award winner that we've had in our contest is L'Oreal. L'Oreal has won the Supply Chains to Admire award winner for five years out of the seven years that we've done it. And why has L'Oreal won? Well, I mean, it is such a focus on the customer and focus on R&D and innovation. And I think L'Oreal realizes they just aren't selling foundation or lipstick or mascara or hair care. They're selling beauty. They're selling hope. They're, it's about the experience. And the organization is very aligned, and it's one of the most clear governance structures that I've ever studied. Rekha Ben Kaiser, no nonsense, get it done, you know, very focused on supply chain. Monster, it's all about innovation, doesn't really have some of the issues that the large beverage companies have. Uh, you know, with, you know, management of bottlers and uh, they've used uh, very focused processes on their customer. AbbVie and Pharmaceuticals is the first pharmaceutical company that has ever made the supply chain to admire. Spinoff, Biologics, and Ecolab is a story of six years of improvement. I'm very proud of the Ecolab team for driving such improvement. Okay. Now, over time of the seven years, I have seen less process companies score in the winner circle and more and more discrete companies. And I think one of the issues is that the process companies tend to be a bit larger and they tend to have more politics and they tend to get really confused about supply chain excellence. But let's look at the discrete industries. TSMC is one of the best case studies I've ever seen of building value networks. Basically, they share what's happening in the foundries with their downstream partners so that they can design and innovate. Lockheed Martin does a great job with their suppliers. You know, if you want to know questions of supplier performance versus, you know, conformance design, you call a 1-800 number and a senior Lockheed engineer will answer the phone. Uh, Broadcom, United Tractors, Samsung, you know, all great companies globally. Sleep Number is a company I've written some recent case studies about, which is very focused on the customer. And they're not selling beds, they're selling sleep. And they carry the white glove all the way to the shop floor and to your home. VF has struggled with the uh, coalitions, but made it into the winner's circle this year. SO Abloy, iRobot, Toro, Borg Warner, Packard, so Borg Warner and Packard in the automotive uh, afterparts, but no major auto companies make it. ResMed uh, makes it, and ResMed makes uh, breathing devices, and Rockwell Automation makes it for the second year. Now, when you look at this list, this list does not really replicate what most people think about with supply chain excellence. If you ask people who does supply chain well, you wouldn't get this list. But we're not disciplined enough in supply chain to hold supply chain leaders accountable for performance. 
And so over time, we're tracking it and you can see all of this data and what we publish. So you can look at what's happening over time. And you can see it's hard for companies to stay in the winner circle. You know, if you look at, you know, who's made it and who hasn't, you can see that Dollar General, Dollar Tree, TJX have been frequent uh, winners in retail and in process, uh, it's Ecolab, L'Oreal, Monster, PCA has historically made it, didn't make it here. They're a packaging company. And if you look at the discrete industries, Apple has made it in previous years. They don't make it here. Apple has struggled to manage channel demand. It's an interesting story. Cisco used to make it. They no longer make it. Herman Miller has made it recently, but didn't make it this year. And you can see that TSMC has made it for five years uh, competing with L'Oreal. And what can we learn from this? Well, what I'd like you to learn if we look at, you know, just a particular industry, because we look at individual industries, you know, we start with what is the industry pattern? And so if you're benchmarking, please use my data and find out your industry pattern. So L'Oreal is in personal products. So when we look at the industry pattern, you can see that inventory turns have fallen 35% and they have slowly improved margin in this particular industry, but not really balanced inventory turns. Here's L'Oreal, right? L'Oreal has beat that industry average Yes, they've slipped some on inventory turns, but the industry has as well. But look at the average, 17% margin, 2.93 inventory turns versus the peer group. And here is the total peer group. So when you look at the supply chains to admire, which I didn't bore you with all the industries, what we do is we look at the peer group, we look at growth, we look at inventory turns, operating margin, return on invested capital, price to book, and market capitalization, because that's our value metric. The supply chain index is the measurement of improvement. The lower the value on the supply chain index, the more improvement companies are making. So Estee Lauder is a one here. They're driving more improvement than the rest of the peer group. But you remember, if you got a lot to lose, it'll be easier for you to drive improvement. Whereas L'Oreal, you know, is not number one in improvement, but they're number four, but they're driving much higher value across the performance, right? So, some people say, well, Laura, how does this compare to the Gartner top 25? And, you know, in the spirit of transparency, I was at a company called AMR Research, which got bought by Gartner and was the genesis of the Gartner top 25. The Gartner top 25 looks at very large companies, roughly 300 companies, and it's a very short term horizon. So I don't see the results in the short term horizon that I see in the patterns of the longer term horizon. And the Gardner Top 25 is 50% opinion. So if you remember, you know, I said, if you ask people who's doing it well, it's typically the people that are speaking on all the stages. And nobody holds the speakers accountable for business results. And then it's looking at quantitative results on some very short-term metrics. So seventh year on the supply chain stood Meyer. It's my goal to write a book on the supply chain to admire case study winners. And I do eBooks every year where I'm collecting stories, but I want to do a hard copy book on around driving supply chain excellence and what can we learn. And so, you know, if we look at retail, retailers have struggled uh, with what's happening in the patterns. They've lost uh, their ability to manage cost with the inability to adapt to the e-commerce effect and their ability to design the supply chain and to basically drive improvements. Pharmaceuticals, uh, you know, has the highest margin. 
Only one company has made it into the supply chain, Stood Meyer. If you look at the Gartner top 25, you know, it's uh, 20, 13 for process industries. Uh, so it's a tougher metric for the supply chain Stood Meyer than the Gartner top 25. And likewise, the supply chain Stood Meyer has more discrete companies that make the winner circle than the Gartner top 25. So interesting comparison. And, you know, just to give you some examples, just so that you understand the difference, let's look at HP. Now, HP is a big Gartner client and look at the pattern of HP versus the B2B technology sector. You can see the B2B technology sector is a very small pattern, 8% margin, 8.64 in inventory turns. Now let's look at Hewlett Packard, lacks resilience, that orbit charts everywhere, 6% margin, 8.83 inventory turns. So what happens if we are not careful, we perpetuate the belief that we have best practices when our practices don't drive balance sheet performance. This is Kimberly Clark. A lot of times people will think about Kimberly Clark as a great supply chain leader. But if you look at the performance against the peer group, they're underperforming on margin, a little better inventory turns, but look at the pattern, look at the lack of resilience, such a much bigger pattern. And it's all over the board, right? It shows the company that's not really good at cross-functional processes or the ability to drive a strategy. So looking more closely at the Gartner Top 25 at the intersection, you know, you can see that many companies in the Gartner Top 25 underperform in both improvement and performance, and we don't hold them accountable. And likewise, we have a lot of companies that are driving in performance against the peer group, but not driving improvement and fewer companies that we both agree on. So the overlap between the three companies here in the two methodologies is where we agree. So when you think about supply chain excellence, right, and you're getting started, I want you to have an honest conversation with yourself and your organization. What is supply chain excellence? And what is the value that we bring to our shareholders? And what can we learn from the analysis? And the first thing I think we've got to learn is we must learn from the past to unlearn to build better. We do not have best practices. And the reason I say that is if we had best practices, 96% of companies would not be stuck at the intersection of operating margin and inventory turns like Kimberly Clark and Yola Packard. You know, what's happening at the executive level because they can't simulate the supply chain is it's knee jerk. We're gonna save inventory today. We're gonna to save costs tomorrow. We're only gonna focus on singular metrics. We're gonna focus on functional metrics. We must learn to unlearn that behavior. We must train the financial teams to understand that this supply chain system is a complex nonlinear system to build better and align the organization to focus functionally on reliability metrics and to be able to define supply chain excellence for a path forward. It's not a trivial topic. It's something that I've been working on for about 15 years and you know, I could you know, talk on and on, but build your balance scorecard, right? You may not like mine, but you know, don't think that it's a trivial discussion of just a triangle of cost versus inventory versus customer service, because it really gets into your asset complexity and your growth strategies and what's happening in the rhythms and cycles of the supply chain. So my insights, you know, people say to me, well, Laura, what makes a difference for a company to be in the winner circle? I think it's largely about leadership, right? It was about Keith Harrison at Procter and Gamble in 1982, building those strong processes that crossed manufacturing with delivery and the focus on the customer. It's about the culture at L'Oreal, about focus on the customer. It's about the customer centric definition of sleep number. They're not selling beds, they're sleeping a better night's sleep. It's about leadership at Ecolab 
It's about business redefinition and re retail. There is no significant difference in performance on technologies deployed. And, you know, I've traveled the world and you get off the plane and, you know, you see the best run supply chains run this technology and the best run supply chains use these consultants. It's not true. It's just not true. You know, companies that drive the best performance at the core are very centered in driving value for their customers. And it's about leadership and it's about year over year focused performance on strategy. 67% of supply chains drive performance in single metrics, throwing the supply chain out of balance and reducing value. And, you know, I just wrote a case study for Forbes on Kraft Heinz brilliant you know case study of doing it wrong where they focused on you know zero based budgeting they have much better value on operating margin but they're not able to manage inventory and they're not able to drive growth and lastly question the status quo we don't have best practices we have historic practices we have traditional practices and Take the challenge to build better because only 4% of companies outperform their peer group. So when companies come in and they talk to me about the digital supply chain and they talk to me about next generation supply chain, I'm like, the worst thing we can do is put yesterday's practices on steroids and make them faster and paperless because it will just make us faster at being bad performers, right? And so many people have so much pent up energy to use new technologies to make today's processes faster. And I say, forget about it. Instead, we need to be outside in. Most of the technologies that we have are really legacy, right? And our supply chain should start with the customer. We should translate consumption data, looking at baseline, look at coefficient of variation, do digital simulation based upon coefficient of variation and translate to suppliers and build the network of networks. Today, most people have such a superficial strategy of end to end, of ordered cash and procure to pay and a focus on transactional data. I'm like, let's break the mold. Let's do better. Let's use new technologies in this time where we're sitting at home to build better. And that's my presentation, Martin. I hope it helps. Um, there might be questions. I, I have some, some remarks and questions. Maybe you could put up your screen, we can see you, and maybe can people see you. Um, yeah, um, so um, how do uh, supply chain executive react or respond to your overview? You know, because uh, they might think they are doing better. So what is uh, the response of supply chain executives when they see this long list and uh, even higher inventory levels? Many people will say I make their head hurt. <laughs> and they'll look at their orbit chart and they'll scratch their head. It's such a new way of looking at it. And I'll often we'll have a big conference room where people will get up and they'll point at the orbit chart and they'll tell me stories about the choices they made or the choices they wish they had made. And it's just a new way of looking at it. But I think it's an important way to look at it. Uh, another comment, you know, uh, how do you can compare companies? Uh, for example, uh, I think there's a question from Henkel. You know, you have Henkel, three divisions, adhesives, uh, laundry and home care, and um, cosmopolitan uh, products, uh, beauty products. So how do you compare a whole company or should you compare three divisions? It's a great question. We'd love to compare three divisions, but Hinkle doesn't report publicly for three divisions. So we take the most significant division and compare it against the peer groups. So Hinkle is in the household products peer group. But many companies will hire us to go in and do the division comparison and they'll keep that internally, but it's really a great way to look at it. So by the way, um, Brandon Smith has the data of uh, Henkel 
loan in home care, and based on your uh, formula, they have outpaced P&G the last years. So that, that there is some data on divisional level. But I, I uh, invite companies who want a divisional comparison with the data with, with Laura because uh, it enhances her, uh, her, her method, I would say, and it will give a bet better vision of your divisional uh, uh, performance. Um, yeah. And Hinkles, welcome to contact me and I'll compare it against our data and help them do that. So you wrote, you wrote a lot about uh, uh, planning, supply chain planning. So, you know, you see no new tools popping up, C cognitive automation by air technology, uh, to name one. So what is the role of this new technology and what is uh, the importance of supply chain planning to be, well, in the, uh, this ranking of yours? Well, people that are better at sales and operations planning will do better on the supply chain, Stoudemire. One of the issues that I have with machine learning or cognitive computing is many times people will apply it to traditional processes. So my pushback to ERA is help clients be outside in. It's not good enough just to enhance conventional demand planning processes. We really need to be outside in consumption data, baseline demand, coefficient of variation, and build rules-based ontologies that allow us to have rules that are many to many so that we can sense and respond and learn. I like what they've done, but there's more to do. Um, you see not of, uh, a lot of working uh, of using supply chain network design. You know, there's a lot of saying about reshoring and look at your supply chain footprint. And traditionally, it's looking only at your own assets, your own factories and your own warehouses. Uh, and nowadays, there's been talking about uh, digital twins, uh, modeling the whole ecosystem. So what do you think of the value of modeling your whole ecosystem with your suppliers and your uh, tier two, three suppliers in a digital twin? Will it help? Well, I'm a chemical engineer, Martin, and I couldn't get out of college without designing heat exchangers and distillation columns. But only 9% of companies, manufacturers, suppliers, actively design their supply chains. Let me just say that again, 9%. Like, are you kidding me? One of the most important things you can do is network design across source, make and deliver together holistically. To look at form and function of inventory, push pull decoupling points, and actively design the supply chain at least quarterly and help executives to understand the basis of the design and get their feedback on the assumptions and make those decisions data-driven and do that first before you conceive the digital twin. The digital twin is a parallel system which allows the simulation in a sandbox but when you build the digital twin, you also have to build the planning master data layer, which is all your planning lead times, your conversion rates, because most of the time people don't have those right. And they're not a single number. A lead time is variable. And we've never had more variable logistics than we have today, and it's only going to get worse. So take the steps, let's start by doing network design, let's get the executive team on boarded, let's start to do it quarterly, holistically, then let's build the digital twin. But people like, you know, shiny objects, right? You know, supply chain leaders are always chasing some shiny objects. A digital twin is a shiny object, but very promising. Okay. Um, it was quite astounding to see that uh, in the last uh, five years, the inventory levels go up and you relate it to, well, um, 
sustainability getting worse. So if companies truly want to improve their uh, sustainability and their uh, supply chain with it, would it be good that uh, companies should focus more on inventories and should have next to their business strategy, their supply chain strategy, an inventory strategy to improve their sustainability? Yeah. And unfortunately, I find that 90% of companies have a corporate sustainability program, but only 28% really take that to supply chain to manage waste and buffers and own the supply chain. And that's really sad to me because a lot of what we have is just talk. Uh, you, you see, um, I think you have 17 uh, United Nations goals in sustainability and that has been taken uh, as, as a measure to, uh, to show improvement in sustainability. But there, there is no true metrics, sustainability metrics right. in it. So wouldn't it be good to create uh, a waste metrics and you name some, uh, material, time, energy and money to make it more tangible? And I think, you know, you are on spot with the inventory. There's so much waste in inventory to, uh, to improve. So I think there is, a, there is no sustainability metrics that companies are showing to, that they are really improving themselves. What do you think? I agree with you. <laughs> so how can we create a metric so you have created a sustainability metrics uh, to be, well, the right one, the good one in your uh, supply chain to admire. But can we abstract some data, put a new dimension on sustainability metrics we can measure year on year to, so, to have uh, a similar uh, sustainable supply chains to admire? I can't find the data. So I'm going to start with Network and Networks, which is an effort that I have to move us into B2B interoperability, just not integration, but to be able to look at bi-directional flows across trading partners. And in the Network and Networks, what I want to do is to reward the trading partners that own shared assets more responsibly demurrage, time for trailer and loading. We don't have anything that really rewards companies for being good trading partners. So I'm going to try to start small on data driven. Uh, one thing, um, well, you know, uh, Unilever was one of the presenters earlier this morning. What I find remarkable earlier this year that uh, when COVID-19 hit the world, I would say, they say, okay, we're going to pay our suppliers earlier instead of later. And they're going to pre-finance their, their commercial channels. And they say, you know, we want to um, be sure that our commercial ecosystem, our whole supply chain or value chain or ecosystem will survive. Is that something you are looking for, how to measure that or how to value that kind of, well, I think positive behavior? So we did a number of research studies around supplier development and payables, and we have really screwed up procurement. I mean, the time to process documents, the time to onboard and the time for payables, it's just not good. And it's gotten a lot worse over the last decade. And so if we think about removing the friction of the supply chain, you know, we've made procurement tough, which is only coming back in higher cost. So a company like Unilever has such brand power and cash to fund the supply chain. If they're going to take advantage of that brand power, they could redesign the supply chain and really drive competitive advantage over their suppliers or their competitors with their suppliers. Unfortunately, we're still into financial re-engineering, pushing cost and waste back in the supply chain and not really using the lowest lower cost of capital that most brand owners have. 
but is, isn't it uh, the role of the supply chain executive to explain that they are not accountable for costs, but they are part of the business, they are part of the EBIT environment, so um, they have to move away from cost. So what, is, what should be the response of a supply chain executive not to be pushed in the corner of costs? Well, that's why I do the supply chains to admire, to give them some ammunition, so to speak. And I encourage them to do the modeling to try to drive supply chain at a board level. But if you remember, one of the top five issues is executive understanding of supply chain. Most people don't understand it's a complex nonlinear system. Most people think it's a simple triangle. Most people think if I make an efficient silo, do the best at manufacturing, I'm gonna have the lowest total cost. Only 29% of companies measure total cost. So we have to have a more holistic view. And you know, I see a lot of companies are struggling to get uh, the cost to serve, especially on a product or even on a SKU level. So, right. but, but the, the information is out there in your company, or isn't it? Is, is, there, is there a struggle to get the right cost to serve per SKU to make better decisions? The data's there. The data model may not be there. But what most people do is they start and stop with complexity and cost to serve analysis. And the reason? Functional bonus incentives. Marketing is incented for new product launch. Doesn't have to be a good product launch. Sales is incented for volume. Doesn't have to be profitable volume. And only 50% of trade promotions are ever evaluated in consumer products. We don't know what baseline lift is. Mm. So when we get caught in the functional trap of very efficient silos trying to accomplish their bonus goals, we cause a lot of waste and friction and ineffective supply chains. All right, um, so in a lot of the companies you have researched in your supply chains to admire are American based or, you know, um, do you want to, you know, call out to the viewers to get more European or Asian based companies to be involved in this, this uh, comparison to get a better grasp of how supply chains are, are around the world or maybe are European uh, supply chain executives better because, you know, we are, you know, talking a lot to each other where in the US it might be more directive. Do you see cultural differences around the world, European supply chain or US companies or Asian companies? Do you see cultural differences in how to approach supply chain? I do. So you asked me several questions. <laughs> yes, sorry. <laughs> the first one is if it's a publicly reported company, whether it's on a European stock exchange or a US stock exchange or an Asian stock exchange, we look at it in the supply chain to admire. Second is, are there cultural differences? Absolutely. One of the first cultural differences is the European teams aren't as diverse. There aren't as many women, not as many people of color, but they're happier. You know, the European teams rate much happier with the status quo than the Asian teams. And the Asian teams are more likely to push the boundaries than the North American teams. So the finance directors in Europe play a much heavier handed role in supply chain, very tense feedback on innovation. Everything's got to be ROI and, you know, we've got very tight controls. Not so in Asia, not so in South America necessarily. 
Does that help, Martin? It, to, to some extent, you know, it's quite intriguing to, to hear about, the, about this. Um, so we're almost out of time, so we're going to announce the winner of the supply chain uh, start of, uh, from Europe in, uh, in five minutes. So, um, you know, we have created uh, an end-to-end -end supply chain visibility assessment. You've seen it. It's a, it's a matrix of 30 boxes on uh, operational, tactical, and strategic level, inbound, internal, and outbound. So basically, you can find out your white spots. Uh, and uh, so end-to-end -end supply chain visibility is something complex. So I, I would advise companies to download it, to fill out uh, this assessment, these 90 simple yes-no questions, hard ones. Uh, so if, it, it's a no if you haven't uh, or if you don't understand the question. So what should be your number one advice to companies, all the listeners, how to improve your supply chain? Where should they start? Where should they look at first? First place is get honest. We don't have best practices. We have historic practices. What's your orbit chart look like? What do your division orbit charts look like? How does it compare to the peer group? What's your supply chain strategy? Where are you on driving improvement and performance and resilience? Get honest. So, so the straight question from do you have benchmark? Is that the start? Because I get a lot of questions, do you have benchmarks? And I say, you know, what's your strategy? You know, we do have some benchmarks in the supply chains to admire. And you got to start with what's your peer group, what's your goal, and uh, how does that tie to network design? Uh, well, thanks a lot for your inspiring uh, uh, presentation. I know you don't do a lot of inspirations. You do a lot of uh, a lot of presentations. Uh, sorry, but and you do a lot of podcasts and you write a lot. So that's uh, also also very welcome to read. You know, thank you for presenting live to uh, the whole world. I would say, and uh, thank you for uh, uh, the the survey you just mentioned. We did a survey on supply chains within Europe and uh, in the U.S about talent management, and uh, we will publish it uh, uh, later on, and we'll talk about it later on. Thanks again, and uh, we stay in touch, and uh, we will do a lot of more research in the future, I hope. Thanks a lot. I, I hope so, too. Bye now, and if anybody has any questions about the research, just have them drop me a line on LinkedIn. I answer all questions. Thanks again. Bye-bye, and uh, see you later. Bye now. Okay. Thanks, you know. Um, this was a great presentation by uh, a great lady who uh, knows a lot and has done a lot of re research and has uh, cracked a hard nuts about supply chain metrics uh, and showed it uh, to the world and to especially to uh, board of directors what supply chain is all about or what should be supply chain all about.